um, the Acts of the Apostles, written by Luke, a companion of Paul. Uh, we believe it was written sometime um, right after AD 60, probably AD 62 to 69, as we've talked about. And it is the story of the birth and the early growth of the church. We looked at the map uh, a couple of weeks now, I think, uh, talking about by the end of the first century, Christianity had spread throughout the entire eastern and central Mediterranean. By the end of the second century, the, virtually the entire Roman Empire. Yeah, now let's just hope it stays cool <laughs> enough. It may, if it overheats and goes away again, then don't worry about it. Now it's doing that, that, that weird thing. Let's yeah, just turn it off. It. Let's, we're just going to... I feel like I'm going to have to restart that. That's okay. <laughs> All right, um, today we're talking about, why am I pushing the button? <laughs> we want to start at the beginning of the third chapter of Acts. So you got your Bible, turn to Acts 3, starting with the first verse. This is after 3,000 people have just been converted to the church. And last week there was some uh, question about the baptism. Uh, it says that 3,000 were converted, they came to believe in Jesus and were baptized. This is the end of the second chapter. I think there's some confusion when it talks about being baptized and what the, what the gift of the Holy Spirit was. The gift of the Holy Spirit did not come upon all the people in Jerusalem. The gift of the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples that were gathered together, and that's what empowered um, Peter to preach the great sermon. So that when Peter preached the sermon, 3,000 who heard him speak accepted his message and then were baptized in water as part of, as the process of becoming part of the community that was the, the church. And then we have a beautiful passage at the end of the second chapter that talks about that all of these believers were together and they shared together in the teaching of the apostles and in fellowship and in uh, eating together and in taking care of each other. There's a couple of references and acts about that. But the baptism that occurred there was not the baptism of the Holy Spirit that came upon the apostles. It was a, a water baptism for those 3,000. Now, Peter promises in his sermon, and it's talked about later on, um, Paul talks about it in Romans 8, that those who receive Jesus Christ receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, but not always with that dramatic representation that the apostles and disciples had in the, in early in the second chapter. So the baptism that's being talked about there is a water baptism. Okay? Um, all right, now, Acts 3, um, the first eight verses. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him, them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And, he, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. All right, this amazing little passage of a miraculous healing that occurs by Peter and John. Now let me talk about what's going on here. One of the th things that we sometimes miss is that for quite a long time after Jesus' ascension and when the church was born, the Christians perceived themselves as still being Jewish. There are no Gentile converts in the early church. We're going to get to the first of the Gentile con converts today. But the early Christians were all Jews, and they perceived themselves as Jews. And you see here that Peter and John are going up to the temple at 3 in the afternoon for their regular time of prayer. They were still participating in the temple worship. This continued well into the life of the early church. In fact, one of the early church fathers, Origen, who came in the, you know, much later, the, the, in the 200s, finally, um, most of the, of the Christians had stopped, the Jewish Christians had stopped by that time attending temple, but there were still enough of them that Origen actually wrote and said, stop doing this because you're confusing people. Are you Jewish or are you Christian? And so this continued for a very long time with a few people, but at this point, all of the Christians perceive themselves as Jews, and they are worshiping as Jews. So Peter and John are headed up to the temple, and there's a lame man, a man who's been lame from birth, 
at the gate called Beautiful. Now this is um, pretty much universally understood, and, and Josephus, the historian, writes about this. Josephus was a historian in the first century that you'll, you'll hear quoted a lot because he was a Jewish writer who had been um, a military commander for the Jews when in the north of the country, when the Romans defeated the army, he switched sides and he went to work for the Romans. Not so much as a soldier, but and he would travel with the military, but he wrote a history of the Jewish wars, as they were called, which was the, the process by which the Romans conquered the, uh, the nation of Israel, the Jewish area, the Palestine, and then later on he continued to write histories about various aspects of the Jewish faith. So uh, Josephus is the most commonly quoted historian, extra-biblical source, as you would say. Extra-biblical means outside the Bible. And it's fascinating when you read the number of times that Josephus gives us references. He, um, in Josephus, we hear that the Gate Beautiful was the Nicanor Gate, which um, was a, it's said to be the most beautiful gate. That's why it's called the Gate Beautiful. There were gates going in and out of the city, the old city of Jerusalem, the citadel, the area of David, that were hammered with gold and silver. This particular gate was 75 feet high, it, and it wasn't gold or silver, it was covered in bronze, but the bronze was uh, hammered and done in relief and things like that. So they said that even though it didn't have a precious metal, bronze not being a precious metal, that it was considered more beautiful even the ones that had, that had gold and silver on them. Um, it was a large double gate, and so very popular as a way in and out of the temple courts area. And uh, that's where this guy would, would plant himself, because it was a very popular way for people to go in and out of the city. He asked Peter and John for money, and Peter says to him, of course, the famous saying, Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. There's a story told about Thomas Aquinas the great philosopher and Catholic theologian um, who, during Aquinas' time, the Pope was the Pope Innocent IV. Innocent IV was quite famous as being one of the popes that was most committed to secular power. Um, he wanted wealth, he wanted influence, uh, he, Innocent IV did everything he could to gain properties for the papacy so that he could control more land. Uh, just a very unspiritual kind of approach. Well, the story is that Thomas Aquinas went to the Vatican to visit the, uh, the Pope, and when he went in, Innocent IV was counting gold and silver. You know, he, was, he had a, all this money out on the table, and he was counting it. And Innocent turns to Aquinas and says, the church can no longer say, silver and gold have I none, thinking he was being very cute. And Aquinas says, that's true, Your Holiness, and it's also true that we can no longer say, rise and walk. The idea being, we've lost our spiritual authority because of our focus on money and secular things. Um, so, but this beautiful passage, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You will notice with Peter and with Philip and with all of the other sermons in the, the book of Acts, the focus is always on Jesus. The focus, the authority for miracles that occur, the key element of the testimonies that they make, is always Jesus and what you know what Jesus who Jesus was and what he represented and it starts right here I mean it started earlier in the first great sermon of Peter's in the second chapter but we get it right here and then the interesting thing is he doesn't say okay get up and walk he says arise and walk in the old in the, the King James Version and then he reaches down with his right hand and helps the guy up which has always been, been seen as an appropriate model for the church you know we declare the grace of Jesus Christ and the miraculous power, but we also do the very practical thing of helping people up. Okay? So he helps him to his feet for the first time in his whole life. This man is laying from birth. He has sufficient strength in his legs to stand and walk. And it's interesting, this is written, of course, by Luke the physician. And so he identifies the man's feet and ankles became strong and throughout this story and almost everywhere that Luke refers to um, medically oriented miracles or whatever, he always gives extra little details. Uh, like the woman who had an issue of blood, who touched Jesus' uh, robe and is healed secretly, and then Jesus turns and sees her. 
He gives also, Luke gives all sorts of details in his gospel about that. Okay, she suffered from an issue of blood, which, uh, and she'd suffered from it for 12 years. She'd given all of her money to doctors, but it had only made her worse. He's got all these details about the ailment that this woman had. So same thing here. So this man stands up. He's leaping and jumping and praising God, and a crowd starts to gather because it's making quite the scene. This guy was at this gate every day. Everybody knew him. And so we end up with quite the scene. Let's pick up in verse 9. Again, if you all have any questions about this, stop me, all right? <coughs> verse 9. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. There it is again. Focus is on Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer, that's Barabbas, be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this by faith in the name of Jesus. This man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and faith and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, this is Peter's second great sermon. Both the first sermon, after the Holy Spirit came on the disciples on the day of Pentecost, and this sermon are um, driven by or built on the context of a miraculous event. A miraculous event that people witnessed. They heard the apostles and disciples speaking in tongues, that they recognized this miraculous event, and Peter, that got their attention, and Peter took that opportunity to preach the first great sermon. Now, here's a man that everyone recognizes as the man who was born lame, has never walked. He's jumping and dancing and walking and praising God and literally hanging on to Peter and John. And so he doesn't want to turn them loose unless this thing goes away. And so he's hanging on them, and everybody's running toward them, toward the, the place called the Solomon's Colonnade. Solomon's Colonnade along the east side of the temple fort was a, a double row of um, uh, marble pillars, marble columns. And they were roofed by uh, cedar, and this was a very popular place to gather. It was just a covered over area. And in fact, this outer, this outer court area was where the church apparently had often gathered. Um, so everybody's running to where they are in Solomon's Colonnade and to figure out what's going on. This miracle has attracted their attention. And Peter uses this opportunity to once again preach to them and explain this miracle is done because of Jesus. Now, he also uses this opportunity to inflict a little guilt therapy on these folks. Um, he says, he identifies the fact that it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, and that that God had glorified his servant Jesus. Jesus, whom you all have heard about. By the way, you guys, we're on the uh, third chapter of Acts, verse 9. Our projector went bonkers just a few minutes ago, so we're actually opening the Bible for a change. Um, and so Paul, Peter goes on to say, you handed him over to be killed. You disowned him before Pilate, who had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One. You killed the author of life. And you, you, know, you can almost see him poking him in the chest every time he says you. He, there's, there's a very strong emphasis here. For all of that, he says, we are witnesses. It's very critical to recognize that the testimony of Peter and John and all of the apostles in the book of Acts was built upon the fact that they said, we know this is true because we witnessed it. We were there. We saw it. And in legal courts, if you have two or more adult males giving testimony, then that has to be received as truthful testimony. <clears throat> now, later on when the Sanhedrin and the Jewish authorities try to suppress the preaching 
of Peter and the others. It's interesting to note that they never try to discount or dismiss the fact that they claim to have witnessed this. They never assault the claim that Peter and the others make that they witnessed the resurrected Christ. They try to intimidate them into shutting up, but too many people apparently in Jerusalem had witnessed the risen Christ. It was too widely known that this had actually happened for them to try to in any way discredit that testimony. They never try to do that. Okay. So here, again, the focus is always on Jesus. The, in fact, one of the most remarkable things about all of Peter's testimonies, and, and Philip and others, but especially Peter, is the Christ-centeredness of all of his preaching. And it's, just, it's even more so here in the second sermon and later on than it was in the first great sermon in the second chapter. Okay? Um, and the whole thing about the healing is it's not me. Peter's always doing that. It's not me. It's not because I'm, it's not my godliness. It's not anything I did. It is Jesus. It is the belief, the faith in Jesus that has healed this man. And we are all witnesses. We're witnesses of the risen Christ. You're now witnesses of the miraculous power of Jesus because you see the healed man who was laying. Okay? Questions about that? It's interesting that here, for all of his sort of saying, you, 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 Peter talks to the Israelites, uh, the people who are listening, as fellow Israelites. Some translations even translate that as brothers. Because they are, um, you know, they are together in terms of being Jews, of being part of the descendants of Abraham. They are related to one another. Well, let's go on now to the uh, chapter 3, verse 17. Let me read 17 to 26. Now, fellow Israelites, that's the same expression, which again, some translations translate brothers. For all of his, his as I say, using guilt therapy on them, and for all of his accusations that they are responsible, ultimately, for the death of Jesus, uh, God's chosen one, still he maintains this sense of rapport, this sense of relationship with them by calling them brothers. Now, brothers or fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send his Messiah, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through the holy prophets. For Moses said... The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Now, a key, um, a key thing here that you have to recognize, this is true in Peter's sermon in 2nd chapter of Acts, it's true here, it's true in Stephen's uh, sermon, especially in Stephen's sermon later, um, and in Philip's preaching, everyone in, throughout the book of Acts, Paul, the same thing is true with Paul. When they're preaching to Jewish people, Paul doesn't do it when he's preaching to the Gentiles, like the, on Mars Hill in Athens or whatever. Their focus is always what God promised in the Old Testament. It's always, when he's, they're talking to the Jewish people, going back to the story of the Old Testament. And here, we get the clear indication that God has made promises about his coming Messiah. He quotes Moses here as saying that the Lord God would send a prophet. He quotes Samuel, the, the, the great uh, prophet Samuel, who is the one that God used to anoint first Saul and then David to be the great kings of, of Israel. The focus is on what God has been saying since the time of Abraham. All right? And all of this has been leading up to this moment, to this time, and it is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Throughout this, uh, these passages, when Peter is talking about according to the scriptures kind of thing, 
He identifies Jesus as the suffering servant, which is from Isaiah. Uh, very strong passages in Isaiah that were very popular. He identifies him as being like Moses, a prophet like Moses, as being the Davidic king that would have been the, the reference to Samuel, because Samuel was the one who anointed David. And then also, all of it wrapped up in terms of him being the seed of Abraham, Jesus being the descendant, the seed of Abraham. So that for the Jews, all of this carried an enormous amount of historical um, weight and in terms of it being a fulfillment of God's word to them. Now, it's interesting here that after saying, after accusing them, you know, you did it, you did it, you did it, in the previous passage, now Peter lets them off the hook a little bit. He says, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders. Now, the Jewish law had a very clear differentiation between a sin of ignorance and a sin of presumption, it was called. It's basically like saying the difference between manslaughter and premeditated murder. You may have done something wrong, but you did it accidentally or you did it in ignorance. It was not your intention. That's what Peter, that's how Peter's letting them off the hook here. He's saying basically, when you were responsible for the death of Jesus, it was a sin of ignorance, not premeditated murder. Okay. And so he's letting them off, and he's saying, because of that, you have an out here. And that out is for you to repent and to turn to God. The word repent, um, this, is, this is almost redundant, because the word repent in Greek is metanoia. And the word metanoia literally means to turn and go in the other direction. That's what repent means, is to turn from the path you're on and go in the other direction. So Peter's actually being a little redundant for emphasis here when he says, repent then and turn to God. Turn away from the path you're on that had caused you to sacrifice Jesus in your ignorance and turn back to God. And he says that if you do that, three things will happen for you. First, your sins will be wiped out. That's the result. If you accept the Messiah that God has sent and you turn from your sins and back to God, your sins will be wiped out. Secondly, a time of refreshing will come. This word in Greek literally means a time of relief, of rest, of refreshment. So you'll, your sins will be forgiven. You'll be made uh, refreshed. You'll be made new again. And then the third thing is, and then he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you. The return of Jesus. Um, Jesus is in heaven. It says heaven must receive him until the time for God to restore everything as he has promised long ago. Jesus will return. So Peter is preaching to the Jews. You sinned, but it was a sin of ignorance. Repent of that sin. Accept the Messiah that Jesus came. And if you do, your sins will be forgiven. You will be refreshed, made new, and the Messiah will return for you. Okay. This is the great <clears throat> sermon of salvation. Now, I do need to make the point, just a second, uh, uh, that these sermons are all compressed. You know, Luke wasn't there to hear this stuff. And as we say, the great sermon in the second chapter of Acts that led to 3,000 people being converted, if you read it out loud, it takes three minutes. Well, it's unlikely that was the total sum of it. We, we're getting highlights. These are the cliff notes from these sermons. But we get to the points here, and a very powerful points being made. Florette. So, from what he's saying there, is he's telling the Jews that they must accept Jesus? Absolutely, that's right, the whole message. Right at, right at that point, that's the message to the Jewish people, where in the past, they never had that message. Well, that's... The message from the time of Jesus on, I mean, this was the message when they talk about the apostles going out and preaching the good news when Jesus was still alive, when he commissioned, you know, first the 12 and then the 70 to go out. They are to preach the good news, which is what gospel means, and the good news is that the kingdom of God has come. The sovereignty of God, the rule of God has come personified in Jesus Christ. And we're going to read here a little bit later. Um, it's here, it's also in John, that... What, what the apostles are preaching, what Jesus had preached is, there is salvation in no other name but His. I'm quoting there from Acts. That He is the embodiment of the sovereignty of God. He is the kingdom of God. When Jesus said the kingdom of God has come among you, He meant Himself. Uh, not me. 
Jesus. <laughs> uh, and so the, that's the whole focus. And what, what Peter is saying here, and the reason they quote all the Old Testament is, everything you were taught, everything that has been said for the whole history of the Jewish people from Abraham on, all of that was leading up to one moment when it would all be fulfilled. And that moment was the, the or that time, was the life of Jesus Christ, his sacrifice for us, his resurrection and his ascension, and the fact that he's coming again. This sums it all up. This is the point, guys. This is what you've been waiting for. Okay. So, so right at that moment, um, the Jewish people that are hearing that are being told there is no other way. There is no other salvation. Correct. And that's also what he said in the second chapter. That's when 3,000 people came to be saved. Um, in, in a, in, throughout all the preaching of the book of Acts, the, the witness is, there's like a three-part three formula. Um, God sent the Messiah, you killed him. God sent the Messiah, one, you killed him, two, but God wrote, raised him from the dead and glorified him, three. And that resurrection and glorification of Jesus is the proof that he truly is the Messiah that had been promised for so long. Again, that he is the suffering servant that Isaiah talked about, he is the prophet that is to come that Moses talked about, he is the fulfillment of the promise king, uh, to King David that Samuel is linked to here. He's everything they expected, all wrapped up into one. And so they must accept that he is the key, the true key to the Jewish faith. Okay? Rich. One of the uh, things about sharing the gospel these days, uh, along with the forgiveness of sin, is eternal life. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not mentioned when you talk about those three things. Do they talk about that at all in... Uh, the New Testament? Well, they did. Absolutely they did. In fact, um, you mentioned the three things, but that's well, that's the, that's sort of the formulaic thing, but what he's talking about Jesus, you know, the nature of Jesus. But yet, the idea here is to turn to God and um, receive the Messiah. Then um, it says, heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to, to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. The Jewish expectation all along, which they would have known in hearing him, is... Uh, the Jews believed in eternal life. That is, all but the, all but the Sadducees. They believed that people would live forever. Uh, the Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. They didn't believe in eternal life, which is one of the things we're going to run into here in a few minutes. Uh, the Pharisees did. But the, the Jewish expectation, uh, Maimonides, uh, much, much later, uh, 13th century, he wrote the 13th, 13 principles, I think it was the 13th century, Maimonides called Rambam, probably the greatest of the teachers of the Jewish faith, he listed the 13 major principles of Judaism. And they include the fact of the resurrection and of eternal life. Okay, so they have held those expectations too. But for them, salvation, as I've said, we talked about yesterday some, the Jewish idea of salvation has always meant, has been defined as, a return from exile. Because the Jewish people have always perceived themselves as being in exile, especially in exile from the Promised Land. God's promise to them was, I will be your God, you will be my people, um, and as you are obedient, I will make you a great people, and I will give you a land that is yours in which you can live. So the idea of God's presence with them, and of the land in which they would live, both of those things were taken away from them in the Babylonian exile. And then they were taken away from them again when the, when the Romans destroyed the temple and destroyed Jerusalem and they, were, they sent off a diaspora, the spreading out. We talked yesterday in uh, talking about Ezekiel, because the prophets all talk about this kind of thing. Um, the idea was in the mid-40s when the Jews began returning to Israel and when the nation of Israel was uh, declared, uh, the idea is this is a fulfillment of what God has promised all along, that the people will return. And again, that defines salvation for the Jewish people. Return from exile. Well, that's not inconsistent with the message of Jesus. The idea is the Messiah will return and all of God's people will be gathered together from the corners of the earth. God's people includes not just those who are Jews, but those who, as Paul says, have been grafted onto that vine, have been adopted into that family. That's us. Okay. We will be gathered from the four corners of the earth and God will live with us. He will be our God and we will be his people. So all of this is completely consistent. But it's not how the Jews thought about it. And that's why this was such an extraordinarily surprising thing to the Jews when they first started hearing it. And it was by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not only that Peter and the others spoke, but also that's how people understood it. Because the Spirit gave them the ability to understand. Okay? Alright, let's keep going. 
Let's go to Acts 4, starting with the first verse. The response that happens because of Peter's <laughs> sermon here. Okay? Um, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed. That word could be annoyed, exasperated. They were ticked off, okay? They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. There would have been more women than that, because the book of Acts is very consistent in saying men and women came to believe. That means that 2,000 more men plus women, you know, they only counted men when they were counting things back then, 2,000 more became believers in Jesus. So the number went from 3,000, which happened at Pentecost, to 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Okay, you'll notice that it says the thing that greatly disturbed the Sanhedrin was that Peter and John were proclaiming in Jesus... The resurrection of the dead. That's the object of that, or the object of that sentence. It wasn't that they were proclaiming Jesus. It's that they were in Jesus. They were proclaiming the resurrection of the dead. The two great parties that were represented in the theological realm. There actually were four parties in first century uh, Israel. There were the Pharisees that you know a lot about because Jesus interacted with them a lot. Then there were the Sadducees. I'll talk about in a minute. There were the Essenes, which was a an apocalyptic community, uh, meaning they expected the world to end at any moment. They were the ones that wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Essenes were a separate sect within Judaism. And then there were the Zealots, which sort of saw their opposition to the Romans and getting rid of any oppression as being a religious responsibility, so they're seen as a religious sect. Josephus identifies those four, quoting Josephus again. So Pharisees you know something about. They were the righteous ones. Pharisee literally means the separated ones. The Sadducees were um, the second big party. They controlled the central government. The reason why when Jesus is up in uh, Galilee, why he's always having discourses and disagreements with Pharisees, and you, and you never hear about Sadducees up there, is because the Sadducees stayed in Jerusalem. They were responsible. They ran the, the Sanhedrin. There were Pharisees on the Sanhedrin. That is, the Sanhedrin was a 70-person council that ruled Israel underneath the Romans. The Romans gave them the authority, the right to rule as long as they didn't do anything that the Romans didn't like. So these 70 men, most of them were Sadducees, which was one party, and the Sadducees had very particular political and religious beliefs. The Sadducees did not believe in resurrection. They did not believe in angels and demons. There were a number of other ways that they disagreed with the Pharisees. They, for instance, focused, in, in terms of Scripture, they focused entirely on the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, the books of Moses. They did not put any credence in the whole rest of the Hebrew Bible. So just Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Sadducees focused on. The Pharisees focused on the whole thing. The Pharisees believed in resurrection. The Pharisees believed in angels and demons. The Pharisees were on our side. <laughs> we Everybody thinks the Pharisees were the bad guys. Well... For the most part, the Pharisees were really concerned about honoring God and doing the right thing and paying attention to Scripture. They did not do it for political reasons. Now, we may believe they were mistaken in places, and Jesus straightened them out a lot because they let their piety get in place of a real faith in God. But the Sadducees were driven by political motivations. They ran things. They ran the temple. The high priest and all of the highest uh, people in, responsible in the Jewish faith were all Sadducees. Here, you see, they're, being, they're upset because Peter and John are preaching resurrection, which is against what they believe is true, and therefore it's a challenge to their authority. They're not having problems with Jesus so much at this point as they are the fact they're preaching resurrection. Okay? Um, and so, they have them arrested. Now, the, the captain of the temple guard would have been the second most powerful or most important person in the Jewish hierarchy. He literally was the chief of police for the temple. 
and he was responsible for maintaining order. And it gives you some idea that the focus the Sadducees who ran the Sanhedrin had on authority that the number two man was the police chief. Okay. Um, he was second only to the high priest. And in fact, as you get further down, it says the next day the rulers, elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest. Now, Annas had been deposed as high priest by the Romans 15, well, 18 years before this. Because the Romans felt like he was not, uh, he was not told the line well enough. But because the Jews believed that the position of high priest was a lifetime appointment, sort of like being a chief justice of the Supreme Court, and they didn't, they didn't in really believe the Romans had a right to depose him. So whenever the Sanhedrin got together, Annas came along, and they would all honor him as the high priest, even though, according legally, according to the Romans, Caiaphas, who was Annas' son-in-law, was technically, legally, the high priest. And that's why, in, in the trials that Jesus has, Jesus is called to present himself both to Annas and to Caiaphas. <coughs> Annas being the one that the Jews still thought of as the high priest, even though technically he wasn't, and Caiaphas being his son-in-law, the one that the Romans now said was high priest. That's why those two names keep popping up, and that's why they pop up here. Annas the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas. John, Alexander, and others, we don't really know anything about them, okay? Um, other than it tells us they're part of the high priest family, all right? Now, this is the first indication of the persecution that's to come. They sometimes say that the arrest of Peter and John here is the fir first act of persecution that the Roman authorities take. But it's pretty low-key in that regard. Um, the, they go and, and arrest these guys, and they put them in jail until tomorrow. But they put them in jail until tomorrow because the Sanhedrin didn't meet at night. In fact, they were not supposed to meet at night. They had actually broken the law when they met at night to consider Jesus as trial in the Gospels. But um, trials were only supposed to be held, or even inquests were only supposed to be held in the daylight. You know, the, the idea that justice is, occurs in the day, it doesn't happen at night. So they took them, it was late in the day, so they put them in jail until tomorrow. And then they're brought forward the next day. And then they make, uh, it, it's interesting to note that even though they arrested Peter and John in public, took them off and put them in jail until they could be heard from tomorrow, um, this did not hinder the word of God. This opposition did not prevent the effect of Peter's sermon, because again, 2,000 more men and an untold number of women also accepted Jesus Christ because of this second great sermon. So arresting them in public did not hinder. If anything, it may have prompted a reaction, a positive reaction <coughs> from the people. And then they make the terrible mistake the next day when the elders and chief priests, the Sanhedrin, get together, they make the terrible mistake of asking the question, by what power or what name did you do this? And Peter goes, I'm sure, I'm glad you asked that question. Because <laughs> that's his whole point, is to talk about the name by which this has been done and in whose power it was done. That was exactly his point, and the Sanhedrin step right into it and give him the opportunity to tell them. So go on to verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, all of these activities are by the power of the Spirit. It wasn't just a one-time shot. The Holy Spirit, at the, at the day of Pentecost, when uh, the Holy Spirit came upon the believers, the Spirit was given as a permanent gift to all believers in Jesus Christ. And again, Romans 8, Paul, and some, some denominations say, well, the, the believing in Jesus and having the Holy Spirit are two different things. In Romans 8, Paul says, um, you do not have Jesus Christ unless you have the Spirit of Christ. And Peter promises in every case, if you accept Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, there may, there, the difference between the gift of the Holy Spirit that we talked about last week, which everybody gets, and the gifts, plural, with an S, gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is the manifestation of particular abilities that the Spirit gives, is two different things. There is a very mysterious passage in Acts 8 that we will get to, hopefully today, um, in which there, there's an anomaly there. We'll talk about that. Okay, but here... Awesome. Yes. And the uh, Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? Well, the Holy Spirit, the difference in the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and New Testament, it's the same Holy Spirit. Yeah. The Holy Spirit that's in the Old Testament, starting with the first of Genesis, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. That's in the first part of creation. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament was um, the active part of God who would, who would be sent, in effect, on special assignment. 
The Holy Spirit would come and inspire a prophet to speak or write. The Holy Spirit would come and manifest a presence or for whatever reason. But once that particular thing was done that God desired, the Holy Spirit would recede again. The difference is, at the second chapter of Acts, the Holy Spirit was given and did not receive, did not go back, remained with those who were followers of Jesus Christ from that point on as comforter, of, to apply, to sanctify, well, actually, to justify. Uh, I wonder who that is. Is that one of ours? I have no idea. I can't do it. Well, I can't do it. Anyway, why don't you go see what it is? We don't all need to go. Let me find out who it is. Uh, okay. It's the red tree. It's the red tree. Okay. Is that something I said? <laughs> all right. Uh, so, where was I? The idea of the Holy Spirit. What was this thing about it? After the second chapter of Acts. Okay. The Holy Spirit remained with all those who were followers and believers of Jesus Christ, and again, is present in everyone who accepts Jesus. Now, we'll get, we'll get to a passage later. Was there uh, another question just, comment? No, what I think you were starting to read it. Okay, let's read it. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people... If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. I, I think that's great. Okay, if you guys are having a problem with the fact that we showed an act of kindness and healed a lame man, okay, let's talk about this. Um, know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. That's a quote from Psalm 118. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Okay? Again, the Spirit is present with Peter, and active is speaking through him. The... Sanhedrin had asked, by what power or what name have you done this? So Peter tells them, it is by the power and in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone, Psalm 118, 22. This is actually the third time that Peter uses this formula. You, you know, God sent him, you killed him, but then God raised him from the dead and glorified him. All right? That, that sequence, just in describing very quickly what, what this, the, the situation was with Jesus. Because they thought, he's a criminal, he's been crucified, cursed as anyone who hangs on a tree, he was crucified and buried, we're all done with that. No, there's a, there's a third part. God sent him, you crucified him, and then God raised him from the dead and glorified him. Okay? Um, now, this passage uh, in verse 12, along with... Uh, John 14 are two of the places where Scripture is very clear, uh, as, as politically incorrect as it is. Everyone wants to say, oh, everybody's okay. Every religion, I mean, the Baha'i faith says all religions are but fingers of the hands of God. That is not a Christian doctrine. That is not part of the Christian faith. This says, there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. Now, people can take that two ways. One, they can think that's awfully short-sighted and closed-minded, and so therefore I'm not going to accept that. Or we can say, that's our mandate. As Christians, that's why it's important for us to share Jesus with other people. Because whatever else it is that they're putting their belief in, you know, if it's well, whatever it is, whatever other religious belief there is, there is only one name under heaven by which people may be saved. And so our mandate is to do all we can to share that. And that's why Peter, against all opposition, and John and all the other apostles, why they risked their lives. And in, you know, only one of the original twelve died of natural causes. And that was John as a very old man, but after having suffered much persecution. Being exiled, being beaten, the legend has it, although we don't think this necessarily is true, of him being boiled alive but not dying and coming out of it okay. Um, but all of the rest of them were crucified, crucified upside down, hacked to death with swords, hanged, um, stabbed, thrown off cliffs, fed to wild animals. You know, why were they willing to do that? 
because they believe that we have to tell people about this because there is no other name but Jesus by which people may be saved. That was the whole motivation for all that. If, if it was all just kind of the same, well, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe it with your whole heart. Okay. That not only violates logic, because one of the principles of logic is something cannot be both true and untrue. It's called the, the law of non-contradiction. It's one of the basic principles of thinking, of rationality. And so it cannot be true that Jesus is the one, only one under heaven by which we can be saved, and be true also that whatever you believe, as long as you believe with your whole heart, you're fine. All right? We as Christians are motivated to share the truth of Jesus because we believe only he saves. It's not a thing that causes us to judge and be negative about and oppress others, but rather to be compassionate and caring and sharing. It's a very different reaction than a lot of Christians have. Okay? <clears throat> Does yes. that not then bring back the Jewish uh, interpretation of the word salvation to be returning not from an exile, yes, whether self-imposed or otherwise, right. but uh, to God, to, to the one God? Absolutely. In fact, if you think about uh, the intention in the creation of humanity was for all people to be in relationship with God. That's why we were made in His image, so we could be in relationship with Him, so that we of all the creatures could be one with whom God could relate. And that's why we have this beautiful picture of, you know, uh, God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and calling out to Adam and Eve, where are you? The idea that we were created in order to be able to walk and talk and fellowship with God directly. But our own sin, our failing, our betrayal, our being the human race, separated us from that. So in a very real way, coming through by Jesus Christ back to God, to return to God, metanoia, to repent and return back to God, is exactly a return from exile. Because when we are apart from God, we are exiled from the place we are intended to be. Our promised land, so to speak, is to be in direct fellowship with God. And we are exiled from that role until by Jesus Christ we are allowed to return to that. Okay? Judy? I, I've heard this so many times from people. Yes, I believe in a higher power or supreme yeah. being or... Which means that you don't want to take responsibility or think hard enough to believe in anything. Yeah. So you believe in everything. Yeah. Um, uh, you've heard me say many times, people who say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Okay? People say that a lot. I've heard that half a dozen times since we moved to Mexico three and a half years ago, four years ago. Um, somebody who says, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, they mean well. I'm not, I'm not trying to pick on them. I really, I, this is, I'm saying this out of compassion, not out of judgment. People who say that, what they're really saying is, I want all of the benefits, but I don't want any of the responsibilities. I don't want to have to do anything, or commit to anything, or think about anything, or be serious about this. I just want to basically sit back on my float in the pool and let God pour out the blessings on me. I want, I, I, I want all the spiritual good stuff, but don't expect me to have to take any responsibility to do anything, or to commit to anything, or to say I believe anything, or to study anything, for heaven's sake. Don't make me think about it. Okay? Um, the, new, the new members class that we have, I talk about all the different ways in which people believe in God. You know, there's monotheism, polytheism, atheism, agnosticism, um, pantheism, panentheism, all of that. And at the bottom I say, and then the most uh, dominant one in Western society is lazyism. Which means, I don't think about anything, I don't commit to anything, where's my beer? Okay. Yes. Well, you said it best a few weeks ago, and you said even Satan believes in God. Absolutely, yeah. from James. Yeah, James 2 yeah, says, you say you believe. Mean. Yeah, you say you believe in God, you do well. The demons believe, and they tremble, James says. You know, saying I believe in a higher power, well, are you sure that that higher, higher power <laughs> is the one through God? Because there are other spiritual forces in the world. And I think those other spiritual forces, and when we read, um, we were talking in Ezekiel yesterday about Ezekiel's vision where there were people, there was an Asherah pole in the, the temple courts, which is, Asherah was the, the wife of the god Baal, which is the primary Canaanite god. Then there were people, uh, women weeping for Tammuz, which is, a, is a, an agricultural god that supposedly dies every fall and is resurrected in the spring. And there were people worshiping the sun. I believe every one of those ancient gods that they worshipped, every one of the gods that people still worship today, you know, some, whether they, and people who say, oh yes, I believe in the god who is in the mountains and the tree, they don't even know that's pantheism, there's a word for it, okay? 
Uh, people who say, well, I, you know, I am led by the spirit of the wolf. We knew a woman who did that, a sister of a good friend of ours. There are spiritual forces in the world. There are angels and there are demons, and those demons like nothing better than to convince you that they are a deity and to get you to worship them. I believe Tammuz and Asherah and Baal and Chemosh and Molech and the spirit of the wolf and whatever else are demonic powers. They love nothing better than to have you believe that they are who you should worship. But they are not God. They are not the one name, Jesus, by whom you may be saved. For there is no other name under heaven. Okay? Can I get an amen? <laughs> okay. All right. Hallelujah. That is, after all, the point of the book of Acts. Okay. Let's keep going. Let's go to chapter 4, verse 13. This is the reaction that the Sanhedrin has against uh, Peter's testimony, Peter and John. When they, the Sanhedrin, saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, we'll talk about what that means, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the, men had, uh, the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. You know, the guy standing there, standing there, you know, and he never stood before. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now, here it is. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. <laughs> I feel like I should insert the word hollow there. After further hollow threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who, had, who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. He wasn't a child, he was a legal adult, and therefore, you know, a legal witness if necessary, if you had another one to, be, to have legal, legal power in the courts. Now, when they call Peter and John unschooled <coughs> ordinary men, they're not saying they're illiterate, because all Jewish men were literate. Um, they could all read. They were all taught to read. The Jews were a very educated people, which is one of the reasons why Alexander the Great and you know pretty much everybody valued the Jews. The Romans, the Jews were the only group that the Romans allowed to get away with not worshiping the emperor and keeping their own god. Why? Because the Jews could be very useful. And after a while, realizing they were never going to break their spirit on this thing, the Romans let the Jews be the one exception to the requirements about worshiping the old gods. Okay, and the, and the emperor. What it means here is that Peter and John are obviously not, they're laymen. They're not trained in religion. They're not trained in rabbinic theology. And yet, in the same way, and it says, but they had been with Jesus. Jesus was not formally trained either. He was not rabbinically trained. He was not theologically educated. He didn't have a master of divinity. And yet, Jesus consistently kicked the backside of anybody who tried to argue with him theologically. And now Peter and John are basically doing the same thing. They mention the fact that they had been with Jesus because Jesus, not being trained, still was known as an effective and well-known rabbi. Rabbi means teacher. A rabbi is not an ordained position. The priests were ordained. But to have a title rabbi simply means you're a teacher. Now, it became more formalized in terms of they would call somebody rabbi, a teacher, but they would expect them to have had the training in order to back it up after a while. But Jesus they called rabbi even though he didn't have any formal training because he demonstrated that he did have a, a true ability to preach. Now, you'll notice again, in all of their desire to shut Peter and John up, they never try to suggest what you're saying is, tr is, wrong, is not true. They never even attempt to deny the claim that they are witnesses to the resurrected Jesus. Apparently too many other people had seen it. It was too widely known that this had been... And so there, there's a real political concern here. They feel like, okay, we can't stone these guys. We can't you know, throw them in prison forever because 
They healed somebody, and everybody thinks that's great, and we don't have any evidence to demonstrate that what they're saying isn't true. We can't really argue that because everybody would say, uh, where, are you, where are you coming from? That's not true, you know, uh, Sanhedrin. More people would have agreed with what Peter and John are saying than with what the Sanhedrin would have said. And so they basically just try to intimidate them into shutting up and send them out. But of course, Peter clearly is not intimidated. You be the judge. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Okay? Yes? This is just speculation, but uh, it seems like somebody maybe from the Sanhedrin was converted that day since they know what happened behind closed doors. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> they, it's possible, yeah, you, you mentioned that, um, they do, we have reports of what happened when Peter and John were sent out behind closed doors. We know that Gamaliel, who was Paul's teacher, was part of the Sanhedrin. The second trial, if you will, that's coming up, Gamaliel actually speaks to it. It is possible that Paul was there as Saul. Saul was a student of Gamaliel's, whether he actually sat on the Sanhedrin or maybe would have been one of the observers, because in addition to those who were ruling, it's like whenever you see a diplomatic conference, you've got the guys sitting around the table, there's always people sitting behind them, okay? I've been in large organizations where I was the guy sitting behind, which meant the boss was sitting there, you know, to vote, but then he didn't know what was going on. He had to ask the person behind him, okay, what, to explain that to him. Well, it's possible that Paul, who wasn't Paul yet, he was still Saul, may have been present as well, and that may have been the source. But it's a good observation that we know what happened when only the Sanhedrin was supposed to be meeting there. And we do know also that we're told elsewhere that some priests were converted. So people who even were part of the religious establishment were believing in Jesus. So it may have been that as well. Okay. Um, let's look at the 23rd verse of chapter 4. And I'm gonna, there's going to be a section in here I'm going to skip because we don't have time to look at every, everything. Actually, let's take a break first. Working great, thanks. <laughs> We're in the fourth chapter, 23rd verse, and again, I'm going to start bouncing around a little bit in some of this because uh, I don't have time to deal with all of it. But let's start with four, chapter 4, verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Now, skipping down to verse 29. And again, the other passages are valuable, but I have to try to keep a focus on these. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there, was, there were no needy persons among them. For from, that time, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Okay. Um several things about this. The first reaction that Peter and John have after being intimidated unsuccessfully by the Sanhedrin is they go back to their own people, the other disciples, they report everything that's been said, and they immediately turn to prayer. It's, it's been observed correctly that throughout the book of Acts, the people are bold in witness and they are bold in prayer. <coughs> Both of those are major themes. Um, when they pray, they start out by saying, now Lord. And the word Lord here literally means sovereign Lord. It means the one who's in charge. Um, the, the God who does miracles, who controls all things. They turn to him. And they say, consider their threats. You know, Lord, you're aware of what the threats have been. But enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. There used to be a, a poster when I was in seminary at the refectory, which was the little cafeteria, the cafe they had. And um, it was a penguin who was sort of all bent over, and the caption was, Lord, I ask not that you lighten my load, but that you strengthen my back. <laughs> That's what this prayer is. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. doesn't say, Lord, take away the threats of persecution. Take away the opposition. That's not what they pray. They pray, give us 
the ability to continue to speak your word with boldness. Make our backs stronger. Don't lighten our load. That's a fundamental mistake that so many Christians make. We always want the hard things to be taken away instead of that God give us the strength and the ability to deal with them and to move forward. Okay? Um, and again, all of this is attributed to God, not to them. Give us the ability to enable us to speak your word with boldness. Stretch out your hands to heal and perform signs and wonders. And they're praying, giving the focus to God. It is all on His, on His, by His power, the Sovereign Lord. And then they feel again the presence of the Holy Spirit manifest amongst them. Always again the focus is on God and especially on Jesus. They call Him here, your holy servant, Jesus. Um, and the message... With great power, the apostles continue to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. We are, they would say, we are witnesses to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Paul later would say, I preach only one thing, and that is Christ and Him crucified. And by saying Christ and Him crucified, wrapped up in that is the resurrection, because the first experience Saul on the road to Damascus had of Jesus was the resurrected Jesus. Okay, so that was the whole focus. Um, the... There are three sort of key elements in here. The first one is, in, in all of this past, this section of Acts, the first is that there is miraculous healing occurring, and then there is prayer for more miraculous healing, wonders and, and signs to take place. In fact, there are 14 separate occurrences of miraculous events, healings, and that sort of thing in the book of Acts. 14 different times, signs, wonders, miraculous healings occur in Acts. The second focus, besides the miraculous healing and the prayer for more, is the Christ-centeredness, again, as I mentioned before, of Peter's preaching and of the focus of the disciples. It is always Jesus. They, they start there and they always come back there. It's not them, it's not the church, it's not anything else, it is Christ and Him crucified. You know, elsewhere in the New Testament we read that no one can say Christ is Lord except by the power of the Spirit. Okay. Um, it, the focus is upon Jesus Christ, that's what keeps them on track. And then third, is the initial outbreak of persecution, which has only just started, that we'll get more of, okay? From this place, when it talks about uh, those who, at the, at the end of this section, when we said those who owned lands or houses, uh, sold them, brought the money from the sales, put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. This model of the church taking care of each other's needs is something that we, we being Lakeside Presbyterian Church, um, we really are trying to find ways to manifest that. To care for people's needs, to provide for people who, you know, we recently had a situation with Bob Flinke, you know, doing everything we can to try to be of service and help there. You know, we're, we're looking at, we already have pantries, we do food distribution, we're looking at trying to have something um, where we provide coupons to families for food, where they can purchase certain kinds of things. We're, we're looking at that, that they can take them to Super Lake. Now we're we're talking about, I don't know how it will work out, but we're talking about trying to have maybe an institutional insurance program where people can pay on a sliding scale. You know, if they can afford to pay a standard premium to be part of the plan, they pay that. If they can't, if they don't have the income, they pay less. Um, I think the church too often misses the fact that we are called not only to meet the spiritual needs, but to, but to meet the physical needs as well. You know, with our own body as well as with the larger community. And so we're committed to trying to do that. So appreciate your prayers as we try to find ways to do that. Okay? From that statement about people who had properties would sell it and bring the goods and share with those who had need, we then have the quite shocking um, story of Ananias and Sapphira. First, we are introduced for the first time to a man named uh, Barnabas, whose actual name is Joseph. He's a Levite, meaning he's of the tribe of Levi. He's from the island of Cyprus, but everybody calls him Barnabas, which means the son of encouragement. This is the same Barnabas who would later become one of the missionary partners of Paul. Um, he's the one that was really responsible for bringing Paul to the attention of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. So we're told that Barnabas had sold the field that he owned. He brought the money and gave it to the apostles, literally laid it at the apostles' feet. Then we have the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias... Again, I'm not going to deal with the specifics of the passage, to just tell the story. Ananias and his wife sold a piece of property, and Ananias by himself comes to Peter and says, here's the, the, the money that we got from the property. And by the inspiration of the Spirit, uh, Peter says, Ananias, you're a liar. You're lying to us. You're saying 
Because he came and said, this is all the money we got for the property. And Peter says, this isn't all the money you got for the property. And he says, it was your property. You had a right to, to keep it or sell it or keep as much as you want. But you're lying to me and you're lying to the church and you're lying to the Holy Spirit. And that, in effect, that's blasphemy in the Holy Spirit. And what it, that's what it means is to lie to the Spirit or to call the Spirit a liar. And uh, Ananias is stricken dead right there for lying. The young men of the church come and pick up his body and carry it out. Well, three hours later, his wife, uh, Sapphira, comes in, and Peter says, um, is this the amount you got for the property, you and Ananias, your husband? Because she doesn't know Ananias is dead yet. Is this the amount you got for the property? And she goes, yep, that's it. And he goes, you are lying to the Holy Spirit. Why are you doing that? And Peter says, um, the feet of the young men who carried out your husband's body are approaching now to take you out. And she falls over. Whoa. Okay. You do not lie to the Holy Spirit. You know, they were doing it in order to get credit for something they hadn't done. Now, they didn't have to. They could say, okay, we sold the property. We're keeping 50%. We're giving 50%. And that would have been a great gift. There was nothing to prevent that. But instead, they wanted credit. They're, um, the, in a very real way, I believe, um, and other evangelical scholars would say, the Holy Spirit had started by trying to uh, oppress the church from the outside. That is the first persecution, the intimidation, said Hedrick. It didn't work. Now, Satan is inspiring two members of the church, Ananias and Sapphira, to try to seed evil into the church by lying about it. So, to try to hurt the church from the inside. But the Spirit gives Peter the insight as to what's going on. And the judgment against them is severe. In fact, so severe, it says that... Uh, verse 11 of chapter 5, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. You lie to Peter, you lie to the church, fall over dead, this is, this is not good. Now what that meant, the interesting thing was that um, we also have in, in that place um, the story, well let me keep going here, let me, let me pick up um, from Acts 5 starting with verse 12. This is after the Ananias and Sapphira incident. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. Again, this, this covered sort of porch area all along the east side of the temple uh, courts. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Okay, how's that work? Nobody else would dare join them, but more and more people believed in the Lord and were added to their number. I think what it's saying there is... They didn't have any hangers on. You know, nobody was just sort of hanging around to see what was going on because they heard about what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Unless they were serious about committing to this thing, they stayed away. But as they were motivated by the Spirit that there's something here, and they listened and they were converted to believe in the Lord, then they became part of the body. So what, did, what one of the things that Ananias and Sapphira did was it sort of drew a line and said, you know, there, there's no lukewarm here. You either are committed to Jesus Christ and are really ready to deal with the consequences, or you're not. Okay, so it was a very serious thing. As a result, the people people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Again, the reputation for signs and wonders and miracles had, had spread. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Remember that this was the, the way in which Jesus had empowered the apostles, is to preach the good news, to drive out demons, and to heal those who were sick. Now, the part about, you'll notice, you know, people putting, putting sick people there so that Peter's shadow would fall on them, thinking that that would happen. It doesn't say that that was encouraged by the apostles. That was just something people were doing. But when people brought those who were sick or demon-possessed to the apostles and disciples, and they were prayed for, they were healed. Okay? Yes, for it. Um... Jesus said that he will do more and signs and wonders and healings. Were the apostles the only ones that were doing healings? No, you have others. I mean, Philip was not an apostle, and we have the record of Philip. Uh, we have Stephen is said to be a man of great wisdom who did great signs and wonders. So there were others as well. Jesus actually says, "Great, you know, you don't you see me do great things. Greater things than I do, you will do. Well, the first example of that was, as we said last week, I think, the first sermon of Peter's brought 3,000 converts. Jesus didn't have that many followers in his whole three-year ministry. Um, and so already, the, the, 
Jesus' promise that there would be greater things happening after he left by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus said, actually said, it's better for you that I leave. Because when I leave, God the Father will send the Comforter to you. And this is an example of what that meant. Okay. But yeah, there were other people who performed miraculous healings as well, not just the apostles. All right, let's go to verse 17. This is where the persecution really seriously kicks into gear. Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees. Notice that emphasis again. They were Sadducees, particularly. They were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. So they went back and reported, We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss, wondering what this might lead to. <laughs> There's a big uh-oh at the end of that one. What is this? does this mean and where is this taking us? Because we certainly don't like the idea of this. Now, um, the idea that the, the Sanhedrin, who had power, who had authority, their reaction to the fact that the apostles and disciples are still preaching Jesus and are getting more and more followers. They are growing in number. They are growing in influence. Their power has been, been attested to not only by miracles, but by Ananias and Sapphira falling over dead, and everybody heard about that one. Their reaction isn't, we need these guys on our side. Their reaction isn't uh, admiration. Their reaction is, is, is what the reaction of people in power often have when somebody else shows up with power. Jealousy. They didn't like the fact that these guys were doing things they couldn't do, attracting people they couldn't attract, um, performing miracles. And so their jealousy prompted them to arrest the apostles and put them in jail. And then they did something else the Sanhedrin couldn't do. An angel of the Lord let them out of jail. But it's interesting, it says, it's not that they let, uh, the, and the angel let the apostles, and you'll notice that here it says, arrested the apostles. The suggestion is that it's not just Peter and John. It's all the apostles. Twelve of them. They're all put in jail. They're all let out. But when they're let out, the angel doesn't say, okay, I'm getting you out of here. You know, we're making a run for it. You know, it's, we, we, we're going to spring you. Now flee to the Sea of Galilee. You know, run off to the coast. You need to head to Egypt, where everybody seemed to run when they, you know, when they were in trouble. What does the angel of the Lord say to them? Go to the temple courts, right in the middle of everything where everybody can see you, and tell people about this new life. Go right out in the middle, right where you were, right where everybody's going to see you, right where there's no way they can miss you, and keep doing what you were doing after having broken them out of jail. Okay? Pretty extraordinary. Verse 25. Then someone came, that is, to the Sanhedrin and said, Hey, look! <laughs> <laughs> the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. They're right out there where they were yesterday, before you arrested them. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. Who's more, who has more influence with the people now? The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Now, we have no record that the apostles were preaching that, although the apostles, you know, that the Sanhedrin was guilty, although they've been pretty clear that all of the Jewish people take have to take responsibility. Peter and the other apostles replied, and here it is again, we must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on the cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Here are the same elements we talked about before. You killed Jesus by hanging him on the cross, but God raised him from the dead. 
and exalted him to his own right hand that he might bring uh, forgiveness of sins to those who repent and we are witnesses to all of this. We and the Holy Spirit. You know, witnesses to the heart of every person. Okay? They are not going to be cowed by this. They are not going to be intimidated, no matter what the high priest or anybody else says, to not tell the truth about Jesus. Then the real persecution begins. Verse 33. When they heard this, they were furious. This is the Sanhedrin. And wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee, you'll notice that this is not a Sadducee, this is a Pharisee. The Pharisees did have seats on the 70 person Sanhedrin, although it was dominated by the Sadducees. They were the political force. But there were Pharisees on the Sanhedrin. A Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin. Men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theudas appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him. He was killed, all of his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Now, flogging can sometimes kill people. This was still serious. This, it makes it sound like it was light. But it was such a serious thing that the Jews were forbidden to give more than 40 lashes. And so whenever the Jews punished by flogging, they would do the 40 minus 1, it's called which meant to make sure they didn't, dis they didn't miscount and break the law by giving 41 lashes, they would only give 39. That way, if they had miscounted by one, they'd still be within the law. So it was a serious thing, and that 40 lashes as the maximum was because more than that could kill a person. Um, ordered that, um, they called the apostles in, had them flogged, and they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Okay, several things here. Um, Gamaliel was the teacher of Paul. We are told later on that Paul had been a student of the great Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the founder of a school he was considered one of the foremost teachers in Israel at this time. His grandfather had been perhaps the greatest rabbi in the history of Judaism, um, Hillel. You may have heard Hillel. In fact, if you, if you know anything about Judaism, if, they, if you ever... The Jews were notorious, not notorious in a negative way, but they, they were famous that um, a Jewish teacher would not say things by his own authority. This is one of the things they found so astonishing about Jesus. Jesus didn't have to quote somebody else. He spoke from his own authority. But typically, the Jews, when they taught, they would say, well, as the great Rabbi Hillel has said, or now they might say Gamaliel, or they might say Rambam, Maimonides, or, and they would quote some other religious authority. It's sort of like our legal system, which is based on precedent. Our, our legal system, meaning the U.S., I think it's true for Canada as well, that it's based on precedent law, which means if a previous ruling has been made that established a... a, uh, a something related to that, you can claim that as a precedent. Well, the courts have already decided this issue. That was true with the Jews in their religious training. They would say, well, the great rabbis have already decided this issue. Hillel, Gamaliel, Maimonides, whatever. Hillel was, is perhaps the most quoted rabbi in the history of the Jewish faith, he and Maimonides. And so Hillel was the grandfather of Gamaliel, this guy. And so Gamaliel was considered the premier teacher of his day. And he was, he was the teacher of Saul who became Paul the Apostle. And you can see his wisdom right here. This is a very wise answer. If this is, if this is a human effort, leave it alone, it'll fail, like that all of them have failed before that were similar. If it's not a human effort, if this is of God, then there's nothing you can do to stop it anyway. And in fact, if you even try, you're going to be fighting against God, so leave him alone. There is great wisdom here. And you see why Gamaliel was as famous as he was. 
He was a fair-minded man. Okay. Um, then they call him in, and they just got to get that last little <clears throat> in there. Even though they've agreed they're going to let him go, first they flog them. And when they release them, they send them out, ordering them once again, do not preach or speak in this name, in the name of this Jesus. How do they leave? Are they scared? Are they broken? Are they, you know, they probably were bleeding. Are they, you know, are they so attuned to their own wounds and their own broken, you know, pride and fearful? And it? No. They leave rejoicing that they were able or allowed <clears throat> to suffer for the name of Jesus. What is wrong with us? Do we ever think that maybe we need to have more of that attitude? You know, that there, this is part of, by the way, uh, some of the, the great spirituality in the history of the church. Those who felt that suffering inclined them more toward the experience of Jesus, and in that way it was a blessing. That suffering in itself could be a spiritual blessing, an advantage, because it gave us more a sense of what Jesus suffered for us. That's very much what this is about. Rejoicing that they were able, they were counted worthy to suffer for the name. Okay? We've completely lost that in Western Christianity. Ken? When I was in the youth of the mission, Mark Baxter, our school leader, he had been to China numerous times in the house churches and been there with the, the leaders who had been in prison. And the, the Chinese Christian leaders who have spoken to him have said, do not pray that our persecution would cease. Mm -hmm. Persecution is a good thing. Yeah. And well, the leaders in their church. Yeah, Tertullian was the one who famously said to during the Roman persecutions, he said, You cannot crush us, you cannot break us, because the blood of the martyrs are the seeds of the church. And later on, I can't remember who said this one, um, but it was said that without bleeding, the church cannot bless. Without bleeding, the church cannot bless. So this is one of the key ways in which we really don't get it sometimes. Right? We really don't have a perception of what spirituality is all about. Okay? We then have this, the circumstance of the appointing of the first deacons. Um, it happens because there are two kinds of Jews in first century um, Palestine. The, there are the Hebraic Jews, which would be the Jews that are very, very Jewish in their thinking very Hebrew in their thinking. They speak Hebrew as their primary language, although they would speak Greek too. But they're very much part of the culture that was the historic, traditional culture. But because Greek, after Alexander the Great had sort of rolled through 250 years before this, or 300 years before this, uh, the Greek culture, now that was not only the Greek language, but also the way, a way of thinking. It was, um, you know, there was Greek theater and Greek, you know, Greek sports and, and the whole Greek culture. A lot of Jews had been so influenced by that that they were very Greek in their thinking. And they were called Hellenized Jews. The ancient name for the, what we know as Greece was Hellas. And so Hellenized Jews were Jews that were very Greek in their thinking. In fact, this is one of the conflicts between Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were Hebraic Jews. They were very much inclined toward the old-time Jewish thinking. And they did not like the Greek influence. The, the Sadducees were very... Hellenized. They were very Jewish in their thinking. And so one of the big conflicts between the Pharisees and Sadducees was over the fact that they were they represented the Hebraic and the Hellenized Jews. Well, you can even tell by the names, because there were names that are very clearly Greek in their origin, and there are names that are very clearly Hebrew in their origin. So the Hebraic Jews would have spoken, probably spoken and read Hebrew, but their everyday language would have been Aramaic, even though they may have had to speak Greek. The Hellenized Jews would very much be oriented toward the Greek language. They probably would not even have spoken Aramaic, okay, which was the ancient Babylonian language from 500 years earlier, okay, when they were in captivity in Babylon. So you had these two groups, and there was a lot of conflict between them, just like there was conflict between the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees that represented those two parties. Well, here we had a story in the sixth chapter of there was a group of Hellenized widows and orphans and a group of Hebraic widows and orphans. And the complaint comes up that even though we, there's the picture of the church being one and caring for each other and everything else, that the Hebraic Jewish widows, the ones that were more Jewish, that they were getting more care and receiving more of what they needed than the Hellenized or the Greek Jews, that they were being shorted on this deal. 
Now, whether that was happening or whether it was just a complaint or what was going on, we don't know. Well, they present, they present the case to Peter and the other, other apostles. And Peter says, look, we got a lot going on here, people. <laughs> There's a lot for us to do. And I said before, it, it appears as though Peter does not have the gift of hospitality because the way he puts it, he says, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God, which is what they're called to, to in order to wait on tables. That suggests to me maybe he, not, he may not have had the gift of hospitality. And so he says, but we need to deal with this issue, and therefore, brothers and sisters, he gives it to the congregation. This is a congregational decision. I think you need to pick seven men from among you who are full of the Spirit and wisdom and give them the responsibility for caring for the needs of the body. Meaning, they're the ones that are going to take care of, of the physical needs. We'll take care of the spiritual, the spiritual needs. These are the first deacons. They appoint seven men, which they describe as being full of the Spirit and wisdom, and those men are Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, uh, Parmenes, and uh, Nicholas. All of those are, he, are Greek names. So the indication are that they selected seven of the Hellenized Jewish men to care for the needs in order to try to balance out the complaint that had been made that the Hellenized uh, widows had been neglected. And they take responsibility for caring for the needs of the people while the apostles focus on teaching and praying and ministering the word. And then at the seventh verse, so the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. That may be who it is that that was behind the scenes when the, you know, that reported on what happened when the Sanhedrin was meeting. So you notice how many times there will be a little section and then it will end with, and, and they're really growing. And another section, and then, and then there was a great increase and more people joined. You know, and then there's another section, and a lot more people were coming to the faith. The church is growing and growing and growing. At this point, is entirely growing amongst Jews in Jerusalem. The church at this point is only in Jerusalem. It is only Jewish people. Then we have the story, um, starting with verse 8 of Acts, of one of those deacons that has been named. The first one named is Stephen. Stephen is described in verse 8 as a man full of God's grace and power, performing great wonders and signs among the people. There's an example of somebody who wasn't an apostle who was performing wonders. Stephen, for all of his great wonders and signs, for his showing of God's grace and power, some of the very conservative Jews decide they don't like him, they don't like what he has to say, they don't like what he's doing, and so opposition rises up against him. They try to argue against him, and they lose. He, you know, they, they can't beat him in a straight argument. So they decide that they're going to have to do something else. They persuade, it says, secretly persuade some men to lie about it. To claim to the Sanhedrin that they've heard him say blasphemous things against Moses and against God. They um, get him arrested. They bring false witnesses. Those false witnesses say that uh, Stephen never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. Now, these are false witnesses, but to say that, there's, that, that Stephen or anybody is speaking against the temple and against the law, the temple was seen as the house of God, the law was the word of God. If you spoke against the temple, which remember, it wasn't too many years before this, that the whole Maccabean rebellion was primarily driven by the desire to reconquer the temple and to cleanse the temple. The temple was the focal point of the Hasmonean rebellion against the Seleucids. And so the temple took on even more significance to them. But the temple is the house of God, where God literally resides, they thought. And in fact, it got to the place where they thought God was only, perhaps only there. You know, that without the temple, God's presence wouldn't be with us. Or the law of God, which is God's word to us. Well, if, you, if you're actually speaking against the house of God and the word of God, you're speaking against God. Right? That's what they're saying, is he is against God. And so they... And it, Verse 15 says, And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Well, they <clears throat> ask him, are these charges true? And in chapter 7 and 8, um, we have, or chapter 7, long chapter, we have a long witness of Stephen. And Stephen basically goes back to the very start of the Jewish people. He has four sections in his sermon. It is a very long sermon. But again, it's entirely based upon God's promise in the Old Testament. He talks about Abraham and the patriarchs. Then he talks about um, Joseph and the, the period in Egypt. 
He talks about Moses and the Exodus, and then he talks about King David and Solomon and the, the, uh, the monarchy. In all four of those cases, he makes the point that there wasn't a temple. There wasn't a building, and in fact, he ends up quoting a passage that says, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, what kind of house will you build for me? Or will, where will my resting place be? Has not my hand, that's God speaking, made all these things? So he's challenging the fact that they think that they're okay just because they have the temple. That God's on their side because they have the temple and that's where God lives. And he's challenging that. Stephen is openly challenging that. In fact, he's preaching this sermon, and when he gets to this point, I don't know if maybe their faces changed or whatever. He's fairly level, level up to this point. But as soon as he gets to that place, there must have been a lot of rolling of eyes and scoffing and, you know, coughing and all sorts of things. Because... He changes his tone right there, uh, starting in verse 51. Stephen says, You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised, which is a horrible thing to say to a Jew. It means you're not really a Jew. <laughs> you, are, you are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. <clears throat> you who have received the law that was given through the angels, but have not obeyed it. Well, the reaction in the 54th verse of chapter 7 is this. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep, which of course is a euphemism for dying. And Saul approved of their killing him. This Saul would become Paul. Stephen says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You will remember that Jesus from the cross said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Very similar. And Jesus said, you know, forgive them for they know not what they do. And Stephen here says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Very similar. Now, it was illegal for the Jews to stone anybody, to execute anyone. This is the reason why they had to go to Pilate to try to get Jesus crucified. Because part of the understanding was because they were under Roman authority, only the Romans had the authority to execute. They are so angry and so steamed up over this whole thing. When, when it says that they, you know, they cover their ears and yell at the top of their voices, it's literally, ah, I don't want to hear anything else. They rush at him, drag him out, and stone him, which was... That would have been murder by the Roman law because they had no authority to do that. Stephen is the first martyr to the Jewish faith. The first person who was killed because of their faith in Jesus. And the great persecution, the great Jewish persecution began right then with the stoning of Stephen. Let's move on to, um, I just quoted to you, eight, chapter 8, verse 1, Saul approved of their killing him. And it continues, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Remember, Samaria was the north of them. It's where the old kingdom of Israel had been. Jerusalem is what was the kingdom of Judah. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Consistently, whenever there's persecution that causes a diaspora, which is the word that means spreading out, the result of that is always that the gospel grows because it is spread by the people who flee persecution. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. 
In here, we have the story, which I'm not going to read, of Simon Magus, Simon the Magician. Simon, it says, became a Christian. He believed. And then, when Peter and John come up, and they're performing miracles and laying hands on, and, and we're going to read a section about that, um, Simon is so impressed because he made his living with magic that he offers to pay Peter and John if they will teach him how he can lay hands on people and have the Holy Spirit come upon them. And they curse him and say, curse you and curse your money for thinking you can buy the power of God. You, if you've been in the, the church history classes, one of the big problems the church had through much of its history, the Catholic Church, has been the problem with simony. Simony means to purchase a church position. It used to be that if you paid the Vatican a certain amount of money, then you got to be the bishop of a certain area, whether you were qualified or not, whether you ever even went there or not, because the episcopacies, the bishoprics, they generated a lot of money because they controlled land and farms and all sorts of stuff. And so people would buy the rights to be a bishop and they make a lot of money out of it as a result. That is called simony, buying a church position. And it comes from Simon Magus, Simon the magician who wanted to buy the power to bring the Spirit of God on people. Okay? So simony, remember that one. Continuing, Philip has gone to Samaria. He's preaching now. I will say this. Um, two, Samaria and the Samaritans and the Jews did not like each other. In fact, they hated each other. And that goes back a long way. Samaria was where the northern kingdom of Israel had been. Jerusalem was in the, well, had been the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed by the Assyri Assyrians in 722 BC. But even before that, when the, when the kingdom split in two after Solomon, because the people in the north no longer had access to the temple in Jerusalem, they created their own way of worshiping. And over a period of a long period of time, they came up with their own version of the Pentateuch. They denied all, sort of like the Sadducees, they denied all of the Bible except the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books. And then they rewrote that to suit their circumstance. For instance, they had 11 commandments. Not 10, 11. The 11th commandment was that God ordained that they be able to worship Him on Mount Gerizim, which was right outside the city of Samaria. It's a little confusing because their area, region, was known as Samaria, but the capital city was also called Samaria. And so the Jews thought these people were heretics, and they were half-breeds because the Assyrians forced them to intermarry between the, the Jews and other people, and they brought other peoples in. So the Jews in Jerusalem and in the south thought that the Samaritans were both half, you know, they were only half-Jewish from a blood point of view, and they were only half-Jewish from a worship point of view. So they both were impure physically, and they were impure spiritually, and they did not get along. This is the reason when Jesus spoke to the Samaritan woman at the well, she shocked. You're speaking to me, a Samaritan and a woman? Both of those you don't do. The parable of the Good Samaritan. The Levite and the priest both walk by and don't care for the man who's been beaten up by robbers, but a Samaritan who would have hated Jews, he stops, picks up this Jewish man, takes care of his wounds, takes him someplace to be cared for, and says, I'll pay for it. That parable doesn't really make any sense unless you understand that the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. Well, now Philip has gone to Samaria, and he is preaching Jesus Christ to the Samaritans, who were not really thought of as being true Jews. And they start, they see the miracles that he's doing. Again, a deacon, not an apostle, doing miracles. And there's great joy in the city because they see the power of this. Now, we continue. The Simon Magus story is in there. We continue with verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. Now, there's no other circumstance we have where when somebody is preaching and there are people joining the church believing in Jesus, that they send apostles from Jerusalem to check them out. They do go up to Antioch, which is the first Gentile church, um, but there's a sense here in which they're sending these guys out going, okay, something weird's going on here. It appears to be because the Samaritans were not thought of as being pure Jews in the first place, so can we count on the fact they know what they're doing if they say they accept Jesus? Then they're a strange people, and they might have strange ideas. Peter, John, go check this out. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them. I'm going to come back to that, by the way. And they received the Holy Spirit. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, 
Peter and John returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. So they decided it was okay. The weird part about this is this passage, when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That, um, F.F. Bruce and others, F.F. Bruce said and others have agreed with, have said that is the most extraordinary statement in the book of Acts. Because the suggestion that they had professed faith in Jesus and been baptized in water in the name of Jesus, and yet had not received the Holy Spirit until Peter and John came up and prayed for them and laid hands on them, that seems to be inconsistent with every other passage about somebody getting saved. Peter promises, Paul affirms in Romans 8, that when somebody professes Jesus Christ, they receive the Holy Spirit. Yet this says they didn't. Now, the interesting thing historically is, this passage has been used both by Catholics and Anglo-Catholics on one end of the spectrum, and by Pentecostals on the other end of the spectrum, to defend their particular beliefs. The Catholic and Anglo-Catholics have said this is a perfect example of how you can baptize a child, in the name of Jesus and bring them into the church, but then later they have to have a confirmation, and at the confirmation the bishop lays hands on them, and then they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see how that works? On the other hand, the Pentecostals have also argued from this passage of a sort of a two-step salvation. Pentecostals would argue that first you make a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, but then later, a different act, you receive the Holy Spirit. And that both of those things are necessary for salvation, but it's a two-step process. Everywhere else in Scripture, in the New Testament, it seems to say that it all happens at once. You profess Jesus Christ, you accept Him, you receive the Holy Spirit. And then it talks about the fact later on you might have a manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but that's not what this says. It says the Holy Spirit came upon them. Now, there are two possible options for understanding how it is that this passage seems to differ from every other reference to salvation, the process of salvation. One of them, which is what I'm inclined to believe, um, and I came up with it on my own, but other people have already said it before me, <laughs> is that what this means is the Samaritans appear, they were so impressed, it says that they're so impressed with all the miracles Philip's doing, there was great joy in the city, that they had had a cognitive acceptance. That they said, we see the power in this, and we think this makes sense, and yes, we believe in Jesus. But they did not have a heartfelt acceptance. It had not penetrated. It was simply a cognitive agreement. And when Peter and John get there, they realize, okay, you're thinking the right thing, but you haven't really taken this into your, into your heart yet. It hasn't really been absorbed. And so they laid hands on them, prayed for them, and it sunk in deep enough for them then to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Another explanation is as to how this is different than every other example we have in the New Testament, is that it has to do with the fact this was happening in Samaria. And, and consistent with the fact that this is the only example we have of them sending Peter and John, probably the two most important of the apostles, sending them off to Samaria to check this out because they were afraid something weird was going on. And it's as though God wanted to emphasize the fact that, yes, this is real, he waited until, you know, they, the people had made a professional faith, they'd been baptized, but God, in order to affirm to these two chief of the apostles, if you want to call them that, that this is real, and Samaritans really can believe in Jesus, even though Jews thought of them as half-breeds and half-heretics, that it was in the presence of John and Peter that the Holy Spirit came upon them and that that was manifested in some way. So it's, this, the point is, this is not the norm in the rest of the New Testament in terms of how the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And so it's not consistent, I don't believe. I, I believe that the arguments that both the Catholic and Anglo-Catholics have and the argument that the Pentecostals have, that there's a two-step process, is not real. Now, the Presbyterian Church, for instance, has infant baptism, but we don't claim anything, any, any spiritual significance to the baptizing of the infant, per se. We believe that that's a process by where, whereby the church is saying, we take this child into our care. And so the child's, the, the only thing of spiritual um, impact that happens is when the child gets old enough to make their own profession of faith and then is confirmed in the church. So the difference between infant baptism amongst Presbyterians and some others and what the Catholics say is the Catholics say something spiritually significant does happen when you baptize an infant. 
But then the second half of the process is when they get confirmed in, by a bishop and laid on hands. Some churches who do it for baptism say this is, this is a symbolic thing of taking the child into the care of the church. But nothing spiritual has happened until they grow up. Okay? It's a complicated little passage here. Yes? Pentecostal believe that the Holy Spirit enters you. You have the ability to speak to mm -hmm. um, What do? In fact, it's required. Correct. They do. Uh, what does the Presbyterian Church believe? How how is it that you know that the Holy Spirit has entered someone that has been baptized? Well, it's not who has been baptized. That's not the point. Baptism is not in, in the Presbyterian Church and in most churches that you know that are well the churches of the Reformed tradition. It is when somebody makes a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. You know Romans Romans ten. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you are saved. It is at that moment that you receive the Holy Spirit. The act of baptism in water is the initiation right to join the body of Christ in the church, in the fellowship of the church. Being baptized doesn't save you. Okay? Um, and that's not the, being baptized is not the point at which the Holy Spirit comes in you. Right here you have people who were baptized. They profess faith. They, they were baptized, but the Holy Spirit had not yet entered them. Okay? That's the baptism... It's not magic. Um, now, there are different people believe different, different churches believe different things. But uh, the Holy Spirit is a gift giving to all believers when they profess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God has raised them from the dead. That's Romans 10. Okay. Um, so, Marvin? Uh, the, uh, considering how some areas started out under Jeroboam against Rehoboam and setting up their own temples and right. priests and so on and so forth, they were coined. Antagonistic toward uh, Jerusalem, and uh, there was the possibility if they had got the Holy Spirit with Stephen preaching to them that they would set up a, a second. Start all over again. Yeah. We're, we're we're better because we're of Stephen. You might be of uh, Peter and John. So I think maybe there was a, a point where it had to be recognized by both parts, uh, by Peter and John and James and John that. That was really part of their movement. Exactly. And the Samaritans also recognized that, you know, only when we acknowledge that we're all one, it fits. And maybe I, that Antioch fits later on with the Gentiles. I think you're absolutely right. And that's part of why, again, the Jews would naturally have assumed there's something wrong if the, if the Samaritans are saying this, because we don't trust anything they say. You know, they're wrong in everything. And so the, there would have been a danger that either the Jews would have thought those Samaritan Christians are something different, or that the Samaritan Christians, without without some affirmation, would have said, "Okay, we're, you know, our, we believe our, our belief is better than the Jewish belief anyway, so we're going to go our own way." You're absolutely right. The, the fact that Peter and John went there, and that there was a miraculous giving of the Holy Spirit as a separate act, uniquely in this case, and that they were there to experience it, forged that bond. Hmm. That the the Samaritan Christians were just like Jewish Christians. Because there weren't any Gentiles yet, uh, no Gentile Christians, and that would be something that's accepted by both sides because of the presence of, of Peter and John, the two leaders of the Jewish Christian faith. Yes, oh, um, Chris, is there a sense of the time frame between Pentecost and say Samaria? Uh, yeah, there would be, but I can't tell you off the top of my head. I mean, we've got a pretty good sense of that. It would have been a matter of. Um, like years? Six months? No, it's not years. Oh, so in other words, all of this happened pretty quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, almost, almost all of the things we're looking at up until, up until Paul kind of comes on the scene right. is probably in the first six months of a year. Okay. Yeah. The Hellenized Jews, did they, you know, before they became Christians, did they, did Hellenized Jews go to the temple and do a lot, or was it just like? Yes. I mean, they were Jewish. Okay. Uh, it, it was a cultural difference, not a religious difference. Thanks. And cultural meaning. How they practiced the culture. They were still Jewish. They still came from the same bloodlines. It's just their parents and their parents' parents had been so enamored of the Jewish thing. They named them. They gave them Jewish names. They encouraged them to speak Greek more than they did, you know, Aramaic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so it was entirely a, you know, it was a, it, 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 sort of like you live in one house, but you've got two favorite football teams. Okay, you're still part of the same family. You still live under the same roof. You still eat together. But you've got very strong motivations in different directions on some things. That was the Hellenized in the, in the Yes? Just a, a clarification. Uh, 
what, what this could mean is the Samaritans had a cognitive agreement, not a spiritual one. Yes. And how would you put the second one? It has to do with the Samaritans, I started. Well, it had, it had to do with uh, the fact that the Samaritans were such, such a unique group. There would be a danger unless Philip and John were there and they were present when something significant happened that sort of identified that the Samaritans really did believe in Jesus. That without Philip and John having come up there and then witnessed it, you know, the, the people had listened to Philip and heard his preaching and seen his miracles, they had professed faith in Jesus. But in this case, it was not till Peter and John came there that they received the Holy Spirit as part of their salvation experience and that that was manifest in some way and it doesn't tell us how, okay? Um, and that presence of John and, and Peter was so important because the, the Samaritan Jews, as we, as we were saying, they might have seen themselves as somehow different than the Christian Jew, that the, the, the Samaritan Christians would have seen themselves as different than the Jewish Christians, or the Jewish Christians might not have accepted the Samaritan Christians. Yes. By having Peter and John be there for part of what happened in their salvation, it kept all of that from being a problem. And that may have been a unique way in which God made this a special case for how he manifested salvation of these people. They were suspicious of Oh yeah, I mean, they, they hated each other, Jews and Samaritans. In fact, the Jews would walk all the way to the east side of the Jordan River and all the way down through Perea and then cut back rather than have to walk through Samaria. Okay. Thank you. Ken? This is a verse primarily that some branches of the Pentecostal church would use to justify their doctrine and baptizing the name of Jesus only and then the Holy Spirit. Exactly. Yeah, Jesus. the two-step process. Catholics and Anglo-Catholics and Pentecostals both maintain a version, although very different. They both use this as a justification for the fact that salvation is a two-step process. Virtually all other Christians, including Reformed like, like me, <laughs> would say this is the only place in, in the New Testament where it suggests that there's two steps going on, and there, there are, it's a special case. There's, there are other reasons for this, we believe. Every other instance, this all happens in one time, one step. All right, we're over time. Thank you all very much. Next week we will pick up with a brief Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and then we get introduced to Saul, who becomes Paul the Apostle.